Hey everyone, it's Dr. Martin. Um, sorry about that, we're having, <laughs> once again, technical difficulties. Um, so my video is actually not showing on my screen, but it looks like it is live. Um, so if there's any problems, let me know with the video because I can't see it, um, which is probably better. I'd rather not see it. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, welcome to This Week with Einstein Peds. Uh, my name is Dr. Martin, for those who don't know me. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about daycare and advice, and I had a really interesting question, I think, to get out there I wanted to discuss. Uh, but first I want to do a few uh, just uh, reminders and updates from the practice. So this week, as of June 1st, we've expanded our hours back to from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. We're still not doing evenings and weekends yet. Uh, my antici I anticipate probably closer to July as things open up more and people start going back to work, those hours will advance too, but we'll keep you posted with that. Uh, but um, still at this point, 7 a.m., 5 p.m., Monday through Friday. Uh, that includes telehealth visits, um, uh, which you, we do ask that you schedule in advance, uh, and as well as um, the outdoor uh, COVID testing and um, sick visits that we do in the parking lot in the afternoons. We have pushed those back a little bit later in the afternoon. Um, so uh, just when you call in, we'll let you know what, what times are available for that, but we're still doing those every day. And I will report, we do have more capacity for COVID testing. Um, I would remind people that the uh, COVID antibody test is not useful at this stage. So we generally really do discourage that. Uh, we just can't rely on that for accurate information about whether or not you've had the disease or whether or not you are immune to the disease moving forward. Uh, but we do, we, we are doing now the, the PCR, which gives you information about whether or not you actively have. Um, timing is important with that, so if that is something that we will talk to you as we guide you whether or not uh, testing is worthwhile. Um, because there is a change in sensitivity depending on how far into illness you are when we do the testing. Um, I will let you know that we've, you know, I've been doing some interviews here, um, and so we have started up a kind of a video blog on the website. Um, so that's under the parenting section in, in our website, and you can find all the, the old videos there. I just put the one up from last week where we talked about sleep and how to get your infant and toddler to sleep. So those are posted as well, um, as well as you can find them on our Facebook page. Um, on a hugely happy note, uh, Fabiola Rojas has returned to our practice um, from a long leave. She did have her third child, congratulations. Um, and so she's back with us. Uh, Fabiola, you'll probably know from the phone, she does a lot of our triage on the phones and add, add clinical advice, as well as she's our lactation counselor and, and does most of that work in, in the rooms in the office with our newborns. So we are super excited to have her back. So welcome back, Fab. Uh, and again, um, I will remind people that for well visits, uh, we do encourage you to keep those, um, keep those appointments and not put them off because the reality is, is that there may be waxing and waning of illness and putting um, checkups off uh, may be indefinitely means getting behind in vaccines. And um, I had to be honest, there's lots of things we're picking up, especially in the realm of mental health. Um, that's part of those checkups. So I would encourage you to keep those and keep those on time. Um, if you have concerns about safety, certainly if you have specific questions, we'll answer, but we're doing a lot, a lot in our office to keep things safe. Um, part of the expanding the hours was because we don't want the office to get crowded either. And so we're trying to space out the providers that way as well. Uh, so I will say we are still doing telehealth well visits at this point for those who are really, really, really reluctant and we can't talk into coming into the office. It's not our preferred, um, but that still is on the table. I'd rather you do that than put off for two, three months, especially with the younger kids. But I, I would say the same with teenagers. Putting that off, I think, is a bad idea. I will warn you with the telehealth well visits, it does mean that if you need a form filled out with a physical exam, at some point you're going to have to come back and have the physical exam to complete the form. So it may not save you that visit ultimately. Uh, in addition, um, we are doing uh, uh, vaccines in the parking lot for those families who have uh, used our telehealth well visits as well. Um, and I think that's it for the reminders. 
Um, so I did want to get into a little bit about uh, daycare. Um, we have definitely been fielding a lot of questions, a lot of questions we probably can't answer to your satisfaction because uh, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, but I did have a really interesting question that I found academically interesting, but also I think a, a very good question uh, related to daycare. And so I want to thank uh, the person for putting that out there. So the question was really about what's the effect as, as we put kids back in daycare and we're advising the daycare staff to wear face masks, uh, particularly in the young kids, uh, what's the impact of the of an infant young child not being able to see facial expressions, see your face on their development, which I don't know that we have a complete answer. I can tell you from the context of what we do know is that it, that newborns and infants do read facial expressions. So it's really interesting. I'll take a step back and talk a little bit about that. So within minutes of being born, believe it or not, and this was an interesting study that, that was performed, children when shown a paddle that showed a face and a paddle that had just a very kind of mixed scrambled image um, quickly oriented to the face um, and, and as a way of sort of demonstrating that they do recognize faces over other shapes and forms um, so that's within minutes of birth which is pretty amazing um, within a few hours if you do that same experiment with different faces in a mother's face the infant can recognize the mother already. And that's only within a few hours of birth. Um, by five months, kids can read uh, facial expression uh, for emotional states. And actually, I, it's one of the things I love about doing checkups at two, four, and six months uh, is being able to smile at kids, have them smile back, and they're quite responsive. Not only that, as they get closer to six months, they start to look at the parent um, to judge how they should interpret me. Um, which I find really interesting. Um, and so you really start to see some of those anxieties and worries between six and nine months, but part of it's based on how the parent responds to us as providers in the room. And so the face mask question in daycare, as, 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 and I'm absolutely gonna advise face care providers, both for their protection as well as the protection of our kids to wear face masks, uh, does beg the question of what's the impact on an infant who can't read all of your facial expressions. Now I will tell you, and there's been research on even just your eyes, um, how you emote through your eyes. So I do think there's some capacity for infants to utilize that information. And so they're not totally not getting any facial expressions. So I, I don't think it's completely safe to say that they're not getting any input. They're just not getting as much because they can't really read the lower face with a mask. Um, so I, I will say on an a anecdotal note, it's interesting. So I, I, like I said, I, with babies, I tend to like smile and talk to them and do those things. They're, they still smile in response to the things I'm doing. And I don't know if it's because they're reading my eyes or my voice. Um, so you definitely, and, and that's me as a stranger, right? And so daycare, they're going to get to know them better. But so there's definitely still, still some responsiveness there. Um, I think it's a great question that probably bears having some research. Um, I know it, where I was, I trained at NYU, uh, there's a child study center there, and one of the studies I still remember seeing videos about, which always broke my heart seeing it, they actually did a study where they would have the parent in front of the infant or, or young, a young child, and um, when at one point they would have the parent inter, you know, interacting, and all of a sudden they would instruct the parent to completely go devoid emotionally on their facial expressions. And I would say with most kids within 20 seconds, they started, they went from happy, smiling, laughing. They would first start to make noise and try to get the parent to do something. And when the parent didn't respond, they would get very emotionally upset, cry and those kinds of things, which are like, oh God, make them stop. Um, so I don't even know how they got parents to do that study. Uh, so, you know, kids, kids are aware of that stuff, but I, but I do think what's interesting, I, I do think there's probably enough left of the face that there's still some responsiveness there, but I, I think it's a great question, and I, I don't know the full answer. Maybe there is um, longer term. It's there. There may be some negatives to that. I think it probably, for me, would just be all the more important that the daycare providers have lower ratios and be interacting, be much more mindful of being interact interacting in other ways through their speech and uh, and, and 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 be attentive to the kids um, because of that. So great question. I'm sorry I don't have an exact answer. Um, I think it's probably something that would be worth studying and 
unfortunately won't give us an answer of how to do things now, but moving forward. Um, face masks are another one that comes up with daycare. Um, and whether or not you should put children, um, put face masks on children. So the clear cut, I will say under two, absolutely not. For the infants, um, it is actually dangerous to put it on and obstruct their airway. Their airway is already small. So we know even with things like putting them in um, swings um, during the first couple months and letting them sleep there, their airway can close and it can be a risk of SIDS. Uh, so certainly for the under two age, we don't, we actually discourage any face mask put, being put on, on the child. After two, you have to use some judgment. So if kids are poking around in it and it, it could become a strangling or choking hazard, I wouldn't do it. Um, I think probably the more important thing to focus on is what the, the daycare staff is doing is that they're, um, they're using the face mask. Um, other things I'm going to talk about in terms of daycare. Um, so as people start to return to daycare, there are guidelines, um, both the CDC and the, um, the Center for Disease Control and the American Academy of Pediatrics have put those guidelines out for daycares and for families. So I would encourage you to look on the CDC website and AP website. Um, I will post those for you. Um, uh, we've got a question coming in. I will answer in a second. Um, but yeah, so I will put I will post that for you for those those recommendations. I think your recommendations are interesting. I'm like, oh, so we put this stuff out there. People follow it, right? No. <laughs> um, daycare uh, advice has been out there from the Academy of Pediatrics for a long time, and I find very few daycares often following it and kind of making up their own policies. That's not based on research, which. I'm just like, please, we've, we put this work into it. Use it. It's there for you. You don't need to have a whole nother work group to do that for you. We've done the work for you and it's based on evidence. Uh, and so uh, I think that's a very valid question as you go into daycares, ask what rules are you following? If they can print them up for you and show you what their policies are. And I hope they say something about the CDC or the AAP in that because um, they really should be using those. Um, whoo, you guys are coming in with a bunch of questions. Okay, so uh, I'm going to answer the first one, which says, is there something you can do to help protect little kiddos, perhaps on a walk where the trail might get crowded? Yeah, so one, I hope everyone that's an adult is using their face mask when they can. Um, I know when people are doing um, really exertional exercise, they're often not wearing because it's hard. They, people find it difficult, more difficult to breathe with it, um, and you can't control other people. Um, so yeah, I, I you know one, avoid the crowded areas. So I can tell you over the weekend, uh, we wanted to go for a hike. I just I went west. Go west, son. Um, we went out to Manassas Battlefield Park because there was just far fewer people. As you move towards DC, it just ends up being more crowded. So one, I think a little planning and just figuring out where not to go. I've actually avoided the WD for the most part. It's like, I love going on it when it's when we didn't have this COVID thing, but it's really hard to control distance because that's the other thing, right? So face masks, you know, actually, you know, if you're not wearing face masks, the other the six foot distance and probably a little bit further when people are panting and breathing heavily uh, as they work out. And so that's hard to establish on the WD. So a lot of times if I'm in a crowded area though, what I do, even when I was at Manassas, we would just step off the path and sort of one, it kind of gave them a <laughs> cue that we were mindful of that stuff when we were asking the respect. And two, um, it just we were, you know, establishing distance that way. Um, that's that's about all. I think a little bit of planning too, and just thinking about when people are going to be out and where they're going. And, and I know it was you know it took us and there was traffic for the first time going out to Manassas, so it took us a good forty five minutes thanks to unfortunately an accident. Um, I think planning like that and thinking about where people aren't and going to those places too when you can. Um, Next question says, do you think it's safe for infants, toddlers to return given all the things they put in their mouths? So that gets to a point I actually have on my list of things I want to talk about in terms of policies. So that there's a certain amount you're not going to be able to control daycare. I mean, day, daycare with kids putting things in their mouth, right? Um, I mean, the reality is, is that school and daycares really do act as a petri dish. Um, and as kids go in that, they 
even if, even when they're asymptomatic, which we're learning about COVID too, uh, they go home and they carry stuff in their nasal passages, bacteria and viruses there. And even if they don't have symptoms, they spread it to the community um, and just based on their behavior and their immune systems. So there, there definitely is an, a risk there, no matter whether COVID or not. Um, we found that when we gave pneumococcal vaccine to kids, we actually saw decreased rates of pneumococcus disease in, in our in grandparent population. Um, so what kids do does uh, does affect and there you know everyone else and um, certainly there's higher higher risk um, in an environment where they're sharing toys and things with with um, other children. So the, you know I think looking at the what daycares do and there's advice again coming from the CDC about some of this and, and some of it's just practical advice. There's, you know it's going to vary daycare to daycare what they can do. Larger daycares um, looking at. Not a lot of times they're moving toys and things around, um, but limiting, you know, who's playing with those toys and having very having and breaking up really things into smaller groups that are using um, the the materials that are in a daycare. Some daycares have you know multiple rooms of kids, and as much as they can break those up into smaller groups to minimize the interaction, that's going to be important. That's probably not as pertinent in a home daycare where there's only four or five kids to begin with. Um, but for your larger center based, um, actually trying to not mix staff as well. So not mixing your toys and materials, um, having policies about when and how often you clean them, how you clean them, um, not mixing the teachers in, in the rooms too. So having a teacher go from room to room um, because they're going to be handling the kids and there, there's potential droplet spread onto them as well. Um, part of the reason why we use, you know, protective gear when we do testing and see patients outside. Um, opening the windows and having more fresh air and airflow in the areas can be helpful as well, not having them in smaller spaces that are closed. Um, I think those things are important as well. Um, I do think there's just an element of risk with daycare, and I always tell people that. It's like, you know, the reality is whether kids start at two or five, you know, they're, they're going to get exposed to things, but there definitely is increased risk with the younger kids because you can't control their behavior as much and they just want to experience things in their mouth. Um, so I know that's not a, a, the perfect answer. As we start to open up and we do these things like daycare, there's, you're going to have to tolerate a certain amount of risk. Um, it's part of the reason we want to make sure the rates are down to a certain extent and that things aren't still on the rise when we do that because innately there's risk to doing these things and that we're going to have to tolerate. Um, so I do think the size of the daycare makes a difference with that. And so looking at that, so this may be one of those arguments we made for a smaller home daycare. Um, but for the larger daycares, looking at what they do to make it feel smaller and so that kids aren't mixing as much in those settings where, the, where they used to go out and all play together, this is probably a time where they really shouldn't be doing that and they should have some policies in place about that. Um, the other thing is a more practical thing, um, but I do think it, it affects how they operate and how they're really adhering to these policies is do they have a plan, does the daycare have a plan in place um, when people do get sick on their staff? Do they have substitutes? Because if you don't have any backup, you're much more likely, it's just human behavior, to be more lenient about things. Oh, you just have a little oh, you have allergies, oh, it's probably okay. Um, and so actually, seeing that they're, they're prepared for that situation and they're going to act aggressively, um, that they have policies in place that their staff and the kids coming into the daycare are being checked for symptoms and they're being checked for um, fever as well. Um, so recommendations are usually if it's a, a full day daycare, they should be doing that twice a day. Um, and so, and so um, making sure that they have a policy and they're, like, then they're actually doing that. Um, I will say, and I've always I've said this, you know, there's a certain amount of infectivity that occurs usually a day or two, and COVID's no different um, before a child's symptomatic, uh, but there's still some reduction in risk you can do by getting the kids out early in those situations. Um, safety plans, other things to look at. So they can still do some social distancing. Um, so things like um, nap time, 
um, when they are in the group setting trying to keep kids in circles that are more separate. So part of it is like, yeah, you're not totally going to keep kids completely separate. They're not going to always follow, right? They don't always follow what we tell them to do. Uh, but sh what you're really doing is trying to minimize risk. And so if you decrease the frequency, they're in close contact and the length of time they're in, in, in close contact, that does help. Um, and so again, it's all about risk reduction. You can't make it anywhere near zero, but you can certainly reduce it so you lower the number of cases that could potentially happen if, there, if someone does come down with COVID that's in the daycare. Um, let me see, any other questions? Good. Um, so what I will do is I'm gonna put some of these, so I, I would really, so my advice as you start to have those discussions with daycare, I would definitely, definitely, definitely reach out to them, ask them, see if they have something in writing, um, see if they're aware of the CDC guidelines um, and see how they're implementing, see how what they produce for you and their policies line up with that and then ask follow-up questions. I, I think it's a time that questions are appropriate. I think they're expecting it, we're expecting it and, and you shouldn't be afraid to ask those questions prior to having kids go back in. Um, the hard thing with this being in a metro area I know is there's limited space, right? And so the fear also is that if I ask too many questions, I'm too difficult, then the space may go to someone else. Um, I don't have a right answer to that. I think you have to do what's best for your family and your child. And so, uh, you know, and I'd also kind of wonder if, if someone's reluctant to take you because you ask too many questions and like, is their heart in it for the right reason? Are, 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 is, are they, are they, are they? like someone caring about their kid and asking those questions, if that's going to deter them from having you in the daycare, I'm like, maybe that wasn't the right daycare for you anyway. So another question came in. So it says, we're concerned about our 19 month old missing out on the social interaction skills in daycare. However, we are trying to figure out if the masks the daycare people are wearing are going to detract from this, that social skill learning. I want them to wear masks, but it will be more confusing. Yeah, and this gets back to like what I was mentioning about how they read facial expressions and things. Um, good thing kids are adaptable. And again, I think there's still, you know, between what, a, you know, tone of voice, what they're saying and other parts of our face that emote. Um, I, I still think, you know, that's, there. there's a lot still there. Is it as good as being able to, see everything now, but I, I, I have no doubts that people should be wearing face masks in the daycare center. Um, cloth masks are fine. We're, what we're really trying to prevent with this uh, is dro large droplet, which is where most actual spread of COVID and other viruses is, is in the large droplets that we spray when we talk, uh, when we cough, when we sneeze. Um, and that large droplet really most of it spreads in the first three feet, but that's where the six foot rule comes from social distancing. And so if you're going to be within six feet of each other, having the, the face mask on um, is, is I, I just, I, I can't say no to that. And I, I respect that it, it may affect how kids um, interact, but I, you know, with the daycare provider, it may make it a little more difficult early on for them to adjust to the daycare if they're not used to it. Um, but we're adaptable and I, I, I have no doubts that kids will adapt and that'll become a new norm for them. Um, and again, there's still enough, enough interaction uh, that, they, that they're gonna get something out of that experience socially as well. Um, and remember the other children are gonna have, you know, if they're under two particularly aren't gonna have face masks. Um, and so they're gonna be interacting with those kids as well and still having that social play to some, some degree. So I can't say it's not gonna be confusing for them. I think it'll, it'll probably cause m some delays in how the interactions happen, but I do think kids will, I, I, kids are adaptable and I, I think they will adapt and there's enough input for them to get out of the experience. Um, should we wait to send our infant toddler back to daycare? Will things potentially just get worse in the fall? We are wondering about the timing of when to send her back. Yeah, does anyone know out there? Cause I don't. <laughs> So, you know, there's so many variables going into this. So I, I don't know when the right time is. I would say that, you know, I think everyone's going to have to to weigh the risks for yourself. Um, I definitely don't think, you know, two weeks ago I would have done it um, based on the numbers that we were seeing in the hospital and the increases that were going on. But as we move into the, you know, phase one, two, three, as we move phase ways out, that means certain markers have, be, have been met that really 
mean the risk is decreasing. Um, and so it's just at what point do you want to get on that on that ride and, and you're willing to take some risk? Um, so I don't have a, I don't have the right answer for you. Will fall be better? Maybe. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's a potential that you've probably heard in the news and we're all talking about a, some resurgence as we re-enter things and particularly when school starts up and again that petri dish as more more kids enter the group settings i think there's a real chance that there's a flare-up again the other variable with this is we're figuring out you know in new york i think it was somewhere in the 30 percent range of people actually had whether they were symptomatic or not had tested positive uh, for COVID, and so it depends on how many people actually have been infected uh, we just don't know enough right now to really know what the fall is going to look at. And so it's the hardest thing. It's the unpredictability. And so you're going to have to re reassess as you go. Um, and there's a very good chance and probability that as we move forward with reopening things, that there's going to be a pullback on that. Don't know when. Um, the other variable I will put out there, and this is, again is why vaccines are so important, as, as kids re-enter the group setting, they're going to not just be passing COVID. Like this is what happens during the school. That's why cold season starts in the fall. Uh, they're going to be passing other viruses and things. And so as they get back to a group setting, we're going to be doing probably more things than ever to reduce passing of infection with, from hand washing to face masks and things. So I don't expect quite the same spike but there's likely to be a spike in other illnesses, which is gonna complicate things too, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe it's better, you know, in, in, in July, August, when you're not having to deal as much with that stuff to restart. I, I, don't, know the, I don't know the right answer, and I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we don't have those answers for you, um, but you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to weigh those things. I don't know that I would assume that fall is going to be better uh, again, as because as things start up, I think there's a real potential that things flare up again too, um, and so you're just going to have to you're going to have to play it a little bit by ear, and and make make those adjustments. So wow, I really felt in in, in <laughs> ill ill ill. Uh, prepared to answer some of those types of questions that, and I'm getting them in the office too. And I wish, I wish we had more data and answers. Um, I think this is where the antibody testing may, may help us as we move forward. Um, probably not helpful to you as individuals to get it, but I think as we do population wide studies and really get a sense of how many people have been infected, that's where that antibody blood test is going to be really helpful. Um, and then also moving forward as we study it, it will be helpful to know, <laughs> do these people that have antibodies compared to those who don't as, as you know, we reopen things and people get infected, are, are we seeing different rates? Are, are the people who have antibodies not getting infected or getting infected much less compared to those who don't have antibodies? Uh, stay tuned. Um, unfortunately, we're all living a giant experiment with that. Um, and so I think we'll just have to keep having these conversations and, and keep updating you on what we know. And that's just the reality. Um, so again, I'm going to post uh, the CDC as well as the AAP guidelines up um, right after this, after we're off. Um, and so look for those because I, I, I think they're, they're useful, uh, again, as you speak with daycares. Okay, I'm going to do one last question. Uh, do you think we should get the antibody test or when should we consider that? Um, my problem when people have pushed me to get it, they're like, oh, my child was sick around this time. We think there could have been COVID because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, I kind of tell them no, because the reality is when I do a test, and this is, you know, I, do, I teach, um, most of us who teach in the medical field will tell you, when we talk about testing, uh, we always, like, before you order a test, you, you need to know why you're ordering the test and what you're gonna do based upon that test. And the problem is if you get the test, I'm not going to tell you to do anything differently based on that test, whether it's positive or negative. And so it, for you, it's not going to have any practical value at this point. If you want to enter the NIH study where they're studying this stuff, I think that's great. Um, but for you to take any course of action, that's my fear is that I order this antibody test because it's not a big deal to order, but that you get this result and you're like, ah, you know, my child's positive. And then all of a sudden you start to change your behavior because of that. I'm like, that's not what I want to happen because <laughs> that's a really, that's a really dangerous move. Um, 
And so when should you consider getting the test? I think when we get more information, I, you know, maybe by fall, winter, we'll have more data on which, and, and the other thing is there's multiple of these tests, right? So there's a bunch of proteins that line this virus that we can form antibodies to. And it's like, which one is the one we should look for? And so you've got different makers and different tests out there for the antibodies. Um, and so we're, you know, we got to figure out which of those is even the right one to order. Um, and so, I think the earliest, and I say fall, and it was probably too generous, probably winter at earliest, I can imagine, where we'll be able to make much use of that on a, on a practical level at the practice that'll help be able to guide some decision making. I hope sooner. Um, but I, I, I really, you know, I, I, I really advise you not to get it at this point um, because I don't want to, even if you say you're not going to, it's just human nature that it's going to make you feel a little bit better and change how you behave. Um, with kind of taking precautions and things. So I, I definitely don't recommend you do it at this point. All right, so my final notes I want to go into. Um, so I've sort of <laughs> uh, avoided talking about some of the news that's going on, but I think it, it, it's important that we do. Um, with the riots and some of the racial relations things that are going on right now, our kids are, are consuming the media about it. And I think it's important that everyone um, be having those conversations at home with our kids because they're consuming it. And if you don't have that conversation, um, somebody else on YouTube or elsewhere is, and you really... You know, research shows the most most influential people in terms of determining racial biases and, and racial opinions is, is our families. Um, and it, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, kids very early on um, can start to internalize racial biases as early as two to four years of age. By 12, most kids, are their biases are largely set, um, which is kind of disturbing. Uh, and so, you know, you think your toddler is not consuming some of this, they are. And so, you know, the question is, well, how do you talk to a toddler who works concrete, you know, has very concrete thinking? Um, and it's, it's simple conversations. And I think part of it is celebrating diversity and how we all look different, how we all different, and how great that is. It's, it's simple messaging like that. And you have to be aware, you know, we've already talked about how kids read facial expressions. Uh, understand that you may say words, but if your facial expression reads something else, they know that. And they actually at a very early age can read that. Um, so we have to be mindful of our body language too and our facial expressions when we're having those communications with kids. Um, but I, you know, with the older kids, I do like to start by asking them what they've seen and what they think. Uh, uh, I think that leads to more productive conversations with older kids, particularly adolescents, um, because they have thoughts already about those things and opinions. And it's wild sometimes the things you hear out of kids. Um, and then I think it's important that we share, you know, our feelings about it um, and help help them kind of work through some of their feelings on those topics as well. So on that note, look to our social media. We'll be posting some resources on, on not only the daycare, but also some of the uh, issues that are going on in the news now um, so that to help you have those conversations with your kids. Um, I'm going to remind you to like us on Facebook. Um, and as always, we, you know, myself and my staff really appreciate if you've had a good experience with us in our office. We'd love to hear about it. Um, you can email us. You can Google review us. Uh, you can give us a Yelp review, a shout out there to let us know that you appreciate what we're doing. Um, on the flip side, there are things that you'd like to see us do better. Reach out to me or Leanne, my office manager. We want to hear those too because we're constantly trying to improve. And in a time we're really having to pivot how we do things, hence Facebook Live, um, we, we really impre appreciate the what you guys are experiencing and how we can improve how you interface with us and how we can get information out to you. Um, it's been it's been interesting time, and but I have to say I've really enjoyed being able to reach out to you all this way as well. So on that note, from all of us at Einstein, we wish you good health, good health, and we want you to all stay safe. And we are here if you need us. Okay, guys, take care. Be well.